Hi, everybody. I'm just uh, Mike's daughter and Mike's grandson. We're just wanting to hear what Pa had to say. Love it. Fantastic. So thank you, everybody, for taking the time to introduce yourselves. I know it takes a little bit of time. Um, and uh, it's just really wonderful to know who you're presenting to. Um, so now we're going to move on. I'm going to just quickly introduce you to Hillary Baker. She's one of KBFA's general advisors. And she is going to introduce Mike. And Mike is going to take away the presentation. So thank you, Hillary. Hillary was also really helpful in helping Mike put together his slides. Mike comes from a different generation. We're just slamming together a PowerPoint. Is it's you know these, there's some learning curves that need to take place out there. So thank you very much, Hillary. Thanks, Rachel. I will get going. So I'll introduce Mike. Um, many of you know him, but there's some new faces on the call that we haven't had uh, during KBFA previously. So it's my pleasure to introduce Mike. He's a retired agricultural specialist in the region and also a program mentor with the Kootenai and Boundary Farm Advisors. Uh, he has been a professional in agriculture since 1971. And for 30 of those years, he worked with the province of BC as a district and regional agrologist. Mike has a diverse background, which will be relatable to many of you. Not only has he worked more on the agronomy side, but he's worked in vegetable and market gardens too. And him and his wife have co-owned and operated the Fort Steel Farms near Cranbrook uh, since 1979. So his expertise include forage crop production, beef cattle production, farm business management and economics, and rangeland management. And Mike believes firmly that farm profitability is an essential element for success in sustainable food systems. So today we'll be looking at some soil tests that were done out on LD Ranch. Um, Jerry introduced himself earlier. Uh, so we've been doing quite a few different phases of studies out at Jerry's. So Jerry purchased uh, some land out just north of the Tunaha Reserve, sort of between, I guess it would be Kimberly and Tata Creek in 2015. Um, and he's been dealing with some old legacy effects of previous agriculture. So he's got some very tired old fields, some decrepit irrigation, and he's been trying to work to build the resource back to some sustainable, uh, sustainable levels that can support production and primarily dry land grazing. So Mike had started working with Jerry in 2018 to investigate and try to resolve some of the soil issues. So that's what Mike will be talking about today. Uh, we've been working as well with BC Forages on Jerry's Place to do some forage trials. Um, that's another discussion on another day, but they've been investigating some different ways that you can find success seeding without irrigation. And then Norm Ward, uh, who's a regenerative agriculture specialist, has been working with Jerry for the last couple of years as well to provide guidance and insight on some practices that can help improve um, and enhance the soil resource. And we'll be sharing a field day that's coming up as well out at Jerry's with Norm and Mike at the end of the presentation. So Mike is going to talk through, uh, first of all, some general properties and findings of the East Kootenai soils. Then he's going to share some general resources for soils in the area. We'll go through the soil tests that were done at Jerry's and he'll talk about sort of key points to look at and things that are general recommendations for managing soils in the East Kootenays. And then we'll talk a bit about knowledge gaps and the next steps forward. So I'm pleased to pass this over to you, Mike. Well, thank you very much, Hillary. Can, uh, am I on? Am I live? You're on. I'm live yep. and uh, I don't see a screen view of myself, and that's just fine. Um, but I'm not sure if I'm supposed to be seeing that or not. You look good, Mike. OK. <laughs> well, I'll just imagine myself with a great big smile. OK, well, first of all, I'm uh, thanks, Hillary, and thanks for all your help in this. Uh, I feel like I should be standing up to, to speak, but uh, apparently that's not required. So I just got to get comfortable sitting here. It, it's a thrill to uh, have so many people here uh, with us this afternoon. That's, that's wonderful. Many of these folks I know, some I don't. Uh, and, and again, a thanks to Jerry for uh, lending us his support and uh, his ground actually to uh, to have a look at it and to uh, 
to work on some of the soils and production issues there. That's, that's been great. Um, so I'm just going to um, talk about some of the soils in the East Kootenays. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna go through more slides. So just relax and have a look at this picture. It's a typical view of the trench. Although I'm really surprised to see as much open ground as I'm seeing there. I wonder if this picture was taken when I came here uh, 40 years ago. <laughs> I'm sure there are some open areas, but uh, that's nice to see one there. The soils in these Kootenays are, are quite unique. Uh, they're extremely variable and they're defined by the um, geographic features that we have here, mainly the Rocky Mountain Trench with the Rockies on the east side of the trench and the uh, Purcell Range on the west side of the trench. Um, and we, uh, our, our soils are also of course defined by the climate characteristics that we have here, which uh, we're generally uh, uh, quite similar climate to South Alberta and up through the Calgary area. Um, maybe in recent years, a little bit warmer. Uh, we haven't had minus 30 and minus 40 for quite a few years, but it, uh, it's uh, been quite common in the past. And um, because, of the, uh, because of the geographic features itself, uh, some of the, those features dictate our precipitation regimes. So the precipitation in the valley, uh, in the trench here, ranges between about 14 and a half inches. So in millimeters, uh, what's that? About, uh, about um, 103, about 360 millimeters, up to about 16 and a half and maybe 18 in some branch areas of the trench but uh, that takes us up to somewhere around 400 uh, millimeters of precipitation. So it's a fairly dry area. And in addition to just the lack of, of precipitation, and by the way, it's split about a little bit more precipitation comes in the form of rain than in winter. Winter is fairly dry season. June is our wettest month um, on average by far. And the... Um, uh, one of the things that uh, those dry conditions are also married with soils that are very droughty. Uh, the soils in these Kootenays are, uh, have low, generally speaking, low organic matter levels. They, uh, they are nutrient deficient in many ways. Uh, the pH of the soils in the trench are high, or maybe I could even describe them as very high, uh, ranging from about uh, 7.5, we do have some areas that uh, measure down to 6.5. And I, I do, I am aware of two tiny little spots. Um, one in the, in the West that uh, has an area that's uh, below six. And I think it's just a, a unique little pocket that's there. And the other one is around Hosmer, BC, which uh, I found some soils there that are just below six. So there are certain little pockets that you find where there are lower pH levels, but most of the pHs are high. So they range generally between five and a half or sometimes a bit lower and as high as uh, 8.4, which is getting up there to be very restrictive. And one of the things that's kind of interesting about that that I will just mention um, many folks are familiar with or have seen uh, a slide that looks at the uh, how soil pH affects availability of plant materials. And um, this is just, a, it's a real classic little diagram that shows uh, uh, the pH levels on the bottom and then it shows the uh, uh, six, eight or 10 different plant nutrients and how pH affects those nutrients. And generally speaking, at acid soils, uh, starting below about five and a half, uh, most plant nutrients become restricted in their availability to plants. There's some that aren't changed, but most of them do. And as you get to pH levels that are 
about 7.5 or higher, you get some major restrictions on some plant nutrients. And it's interesting to note kind of the main ones that are restricted by those high pH areas are phosphorus, uh, iron, uh, manganese, boron, copper, and zinc are the main ones that are, are uh, very restricted because of the high pH levels. The interesting point about that is that we also have low, some low uh, nutrients for animals in the, in the trench, and they mimic those same ones. We're very low in our locally grown feeds, and that's, uh, that's on our rangelands as well. Our, our livestock feedstuffs are very low in phosphorus. They're uh, very low in manganese, they're low in copper and zinc. So those are nutrients that are low. And as a interesting little sideline, the Ministry of Agriculture spent about a decade developing uh, a mineral mix for livestock in this valley. And one of the specific features of that min mineral mix was uh, higher levels of those four nutrients that I just made named because um, not only are livestock uh, restricted in the level of those nutrients during their winter feeding period, but they're also restricted when they're uh, grazing forages in the trench, which they normally are. So that's kind of an interesting, that's just kind of an interesting point. Um, I don't think I want to uh, make any other general comments about the soils in this area, other than to just say they're a challenge uh, when I first came here, there were there there wasn't a blending plant in the valley, and so people uh, just sort of blended their own fertilizers. All of the soil samples that were taken in the valley were analyzed at the Soil and Feed Testing Lab in Kelowna, BC. That was also a government-run organization, and all of those samples used to go over my desk, and so I had a lot of interaction with people and their soil tests and fertilizer recommendations and the real challenge of how to blend those fertilizers on the farm just from general fertilizer mixes. So that was, that was a, real, uh, a real unique challenge. So I'm just gonna roll on here to now. Here we go, there we go. Some background information. Now, why did that? This seems to be really jumping around. Um, so let me just see where I'm at because I'm not sure if I'm ahead of myself or behind. Okay, so there we go. So um, there's lots of things that people take soil tests for, but one of the main things that uh, soil testing accomplishes is uh, a way to look at what the soil nutrients are, whether they're adequate or low uh, or plentiful, and to use those soil test results to formulate fertilizer uh, recommendations to achieve optim optimum economic yields and to uh, maintain plant levels of available nutrients while avoiding pollution and environmental degradation. So that's kind of the topic of our discussion today is uh, looking at some soil tests in, uh, that have been taken in the area and talk about recommendations from those soil tests and uh, remembering that uh, a real critical area of soil testing is to not only uh, optimize uh, production uh, economic returns, but also to avoid pollution and environmental degradation. So now I'm gonna turn this to the next slide. Maybe you can help me with that uh, if you could, Hillary. Uh, can we go to the next slide or do you have any control on that? There we go. My, uh, my uh, mouse doesn't seem to advance very well. It's kind of got a trigger set on it and, uh, and, it, and it tends to jump all over the place, but that's great. So first of all, when people take a soil sample and send it off for testing, you have to remember that the sample 
is really critical because the results can't do any better than the, than the quality of the sample that's presented. Um, and the first thing is that that sample should be representative of the field or the area being tested. Uh, sometimes fields are very, very similar. They're irrigated the same way. They're at, at the same age in their production cycle. And often if they are similar just because they're different fields doesn't mean that you can't sample them as one area and submit a soil for that, that, total, that total area. But um, just some of the things to remember about soil sampling, and I'll just quickly go over these, and there's a lot other, of other ones too, but uh, it's important to sample at the right time of year. And uh, often uh, late in the fall before freeze up is a good time to sample or very early in the spring, not quite as good a time because you may have trouble getting the information back and getting the fertilizer ordered if, it's, if you're, uh, sampling is too late or may this the lab may have a rush and aren't, may not be able to get it done as soon as you'd like. So uh, the, one of the features of sampling at that time of year is the soils have been cold in the late fall or early spring and they've been cold for some time and so the uh, micro, microbial activity has slowed down tremendously and the root activities of the plants, even though they are slow, they have taken up moisture before freeze up and very soon after the ground's thawed in the spring. So the levels of nitrogen in those soils have usually been exhausted and you can find out whether you have extra nitrogen left in those soils uh, in order to start growth in the spring and perhaps some of it to be available during the production year. So uh, sampling time is important. Uh, you require at least 20 to 30 different subsamples in order to uh, have a composite sample to send to the lab. And that's really critical. Um, many times folks don't quite get that uh, number of samples. Uh, you should manage the random sampling process. So in other words, if you have areas in your field that are very unproductive and they're small compared to the bulk of the field, uh, maybe you shouldn't uh, have a lot of samples from that area in your overall sample. And areas that maybe are the bulk of the field and they are maybe soils where the vast majority of the production come from, uh, they should uh, they should constitute a, also a majority of your sample. Uh, sample at the appropriate depth. Generally, we're when we're looking for soil fertility recommendations, we're sampling in the zero to six inch zone. And uh, although you can get more accurate results for nitrogen and sulfur if you sample a little deeper, and uh, that might be in many of our soils in the trench, you could hope for zero to 40 uh, or zero to uh, somewhere in the, in the realm of 24 inches. But if you can get it from zero to 12 or 15 inches, you're doing really well. But those deeper levels of sampling give you a better idea of the uh, nitrogen levels in the soils and the, um, and the sulfur levels. Uh, avoid field entrances and traffic areas because you can, they can be areas that accumulate uh, manure from livestock that are often grazing these fields, or almost always grazing these fields uh, uh, in the fall and sometimes in the early spring or early summer. Avoid livestock watering areas. Uh, they do the same thing. Uh, Make sure that you stay away from old buildings and feeding areas because if one of your 25 samples in that, in that uh, group is from an old building site or a feeding area, it can really bias the results of that soil test. So those are just some of the things to uh, think about when you're testing soils. And there's, uh, there's some really good uh, directions for soil testing uh, and some of them, are elaborated on in the references that are available at the end of this talk. So 
can we go to the next slide? Thanks, Hillary. That's one thing. Uh, the the um, this slide set is going to be available to you, so don't worry about um, the details. Um, and uh, it, and there'll be lot there'll be some of these slides that I'm going to to uh, just breathe through very quickly, but uh, I want you to be relaxed and able to listen so that um, you can concentrate on that part of the exercise for now. But uh, there's some great information on some of these slides that you might want to look at at a little in a, in a little bit more detail when you get a hold of them uh, on your own computer. So this is kind of an interesting little chart here. And what it does is it's enable, it enables you to calculate the, um, the cost of the nutrients uh, that are available in most blends or in most uh, fertilizers that you're applying. Um, and it's, it, what we're trying to do is find the relative cost between the different plant nutrients so this chart here shows the actual um, cost of the parent materials for most of the blended fertilizers in the area. And these are very up to date. I got these bulk prices uh, on March 26th. And keep in mind that they represent just the, or we're trying to look at just the price of the actual nutrients and we so we made sure that we've left out things like transportation um, uh, blending charges um, uh, things like um, bags uh, transportation all of those kinds of things are left out of these tonnage rates so if you look at this chart you'll see 4600 right now is worth uh, 728 dollars a ton and if you look over in the brown shaded area there, that means that uh, 70, the cost of nitrogen with that, uh, using that parent material, the 4600, is 72 cents per pound. Um, that's way, way higher than it was a number of years ago, uh, probably uh, around 15 years ago, it was more like uh, 50 to 55 cents a pound. So there's a big, big increase. And then just going further down, uh, there's uh, uh, ammonium sulfate there, uh, 20,024 of sulfur. And you can see that the sulfur price, if you go to the column under the dollars per pound, uh, you can see that the, uh, for sulfur, uh, that sulfur is, uh, costs about 42 cents a pound. So that's a little over half the cost of nitrogen. And um, using 1155 at a whopping over $1,000 a ton, that's a metric ton, uh, you can see that the cost of phosphorus is, uh, or P2O5, is about 75 cents a pound. Again, uh, phosphorus used to be uh, about double or approximately double the price of nitrogen, and now you can see they're just about the same level. 0060 potassium is one of the cheaper nutrients at 50 cents a pound and um, boron a whopping nine dollars and 41 cents a pound so if you're going to be using boron even at one pound per acre or two pounds per acre you want to be quite sure that your levels actually are low and not only are they low but they're actually having major impacts on your yields uh, because you do if at one or two pounds per acre, you can easily spend obviously 10 or $20 an acre just on boron, which um, you wanna make sure that you really need that boron. And sulfur levels, uh, the cost of sulfur here, um, there's, two, there's two sulfurs. The, the one that I just mentioned from ammonium sulfate costs 42 cents a pound. If you use elemental sulfur, it costs 28 cents a pound, it's quite a bit cheaper, but there are some problems with that that I'll talk about later. Okay, can we go to the next slide? So keeping in mind the cost of these different nutrients, uh, this is a really interesting 
uh, little graph that shows the uh, crop response uh, that you get between different uh, nutrients. Uh, the, the two nutrients that are looked at here is nitrogen and pho phosphorus applications. So um, the dotted line is uh, phosphorus. And so there's three levels of phosphorus shown in this graph, um, low phosphorus soils, medium and high phosphorus soils. And if you look at the impact of sulfur on yield, you can see that there's really major, major impacts of yield due to phosphorus fertilization, uh, even at very low levels of phosphorus. So by the time you've applied 20 pounds per acre of phosphorus, which you'll see at the bottom of this chart, the 20, and if you go up and look at, uh, at high phosphorus soils, you'll see that the graph is already plateauing and you're not going to be getting very much additional response to, uh, to phosphorus uh, uh, other than that 20 pound application. Yeah, on high phosphorus soils. But if you go to the top dotted line, which is a low phosphorus soil, you can see that 20 pounds is just really revving up in terms of uh, uh, response yield. And you can go up to 40 pounds and you're still getting a pretty steep curve on the low phosphorus soil. So phosphorus is really critical, um, especially uh, for low phosphorus fields, but the amounts that are required are quite a bit less than nitrogen. If you look at the response to nitrogen, which are the solid lines, you can see that in that high, uh, low nitrogen soil, uh, you can see uh, the responses are still climbing very, very steeply, even after 60 pounds of nitrogen and on into 80 or 100 pounds of nitrogen. So. I think one of the things that this tells you is that if you're going to, um, <clears throat> if you're if you're looking at sort of your most economic fertilizer application, uh, nitrogen is going to continue to uh, produce uh, to to respond with uh, higher yields, even at fairly higher levels. But with phosphorus, extra phosphorus uh, is not extra phosphorus other than what's prescribed or required is, is not going to do you much good in terms of a yield response. So th that's one of the reasons that we need to look at the actual cost of the individual plant nutrients because as we saw on the previous slide, uh, nitrogen and phosphorus nowadays are about the same price. Uh, again, that wasn't the case even 10 or 15 years ago. Um, at that time, phosphorus was much, much more expensive than nitrogen. So let's go to the next slide. Thanks, Hilary. And these, the, the next four slides, I don't want you to, I just want to tell you about them so that you can go look at them later. Uh, this first slide has three different levels of um, uh, three different recommendations from different areas and uh, well, uh, it's interesting to have a look at them. So we'll go on to the next one, please. Uh, this is a really classical uh, fertilizer experiment. The graph on the right shows the average cost. Uh, the middle graph shows the amount of nutrients that were required in those costs. And the first graph shows you the production levels from uh, recommendations from five different labs, all recommending on the same uh, split samples. So have a look at that one. And the next two slides after that uh, is the discussion about that experiment. So it's very interesting, but it's very detailed and you'll want to have some time to to uh, parge through that information, so have a look at it when you get the uh, when you when you download the uh, the material from the from the talk. It's it's interesting and worthwhile, but it's complicated and takes a long time to go through. We won't do that now. So the next section of this talk, we're going to talk uh, briefly about the soil tests that were done on LD Ranch. Those soil tests were taken from two different labs. This is uh, one of the labs. It's the Exova lab out of Edmonton. It's now purchased by another company and it's called Elements. 
And, um, but uh, fortunately, the, the uh, soil test report design is almost identical. It's interesting that this lab uh, determines the recommendations based on what they feel are the response to the, the, the crop response to different levels of application. So, um, and then the other thing is that the, the uh, phosphorus levels, the extraction of plant available materials is, is done with a, a laboratory method called the Kelowna extractant. And just to back up a brief second, um, when, when soils analyze for nutrients in the sample, what they're doing is they're analyzing an estimate of what the plant available nutrient is. So uh, for example, there's lots of phosphorus in the soil. Um, most soils will have anywhere from a thousand to 2000, maybe 3000 pounds per acre of actual phosphorus, but only a small amount of that phosphorus, um, a very small amount indeed, is actually available to plants. So the soil, is, the soil lab is trying to estimate through their analytical procedures, the amount of available plant nutrients, not the total of plant nutrients. So anyway, we'll go to the next lab and just, we'll just note the general layout of these labs. The, the first lab had a nice little graph there to tell you which samples were low, medium and high. Uh, this lab is, um, uh, this lab is uh, in, uh, in Ontario. Uh, the, the lab is in Ontario and the, um, um, the soil test results are reported in, they, they still have the same rating of uh, low, medium and high levels but they just don't have them on a graph, but all the material is there for that. And this lab's recommendations are based on what kinds of uh, nutrient application you're going to need to build nutrients and to have a, uh, maintain a level for, to maintain soil health. So they have, they, they have slightly different approaches in terms of of how they make the recommendations. And they also use different methods of analysis. And you can see up here where there's potassium, uh, uh, over the phosphorus levels is what I wanted to look at. Phosphorus is, is um, they have two different phosphorus levels there. One is 28 um, parts per million. And the other one is, um, 26 parts per million, and those levels of phosphorus are, are measured by two different extractants. One is called the Bray extractant, and the other one is called uh, by sodium bicarbonate extra, or, uh, extractant. And, um, and so they give different results. So they use two different extractants to measure phosphorus, this lab does. and. Um, uh, the recommendation will be based on one or the other, depending on what area uh, uh, the soil came from. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, um, so those tests, those uh, lab analysis were taken uh, on Gary Karchuk's field. This one looks at nitrogen and you can see the red circle there under nitrogen, it shows that the, um, in the zero to six inch um, sampling zone, the total pounds per acre of plant available nitrogen, that's generally nitrate nitrogen, is um, seven pounds per acre. And you can see from that graph, it's very, very low. It's rock bottom low. And that's kind of a game typical of soils where they're sampled in the, in the um, uh, late fall, November period of time or early spring. Uh, what's happened is that the um, microorganisms have uh, quit, their, their activity has quit and the plants have used up the remaining plant available nitrogen. So the nitrogen levels are normally low at that period of time. 
And let's look at the next slide. Uh, this looks at phosphorus and this looks at phosphorus with the, uh, with the A&L lab in Ontario. And uh, looking at the bicarb extractant, you can see that uh, two, of the, uh, two of the fields are low and very low in phosphorus levels. And um, uh, field 006, which is the third field on Jerry's place, is in the medium zone. So um, it's important, phosphorus is a really important nutrient. Uh, and when they're at those very low levels, as we saw in the previous uh, line graph, uh, responses to phosphorus is, uh, yield responses are very high. Also phosphorus is an extremely important nutrient when it comes to root development and root growth. So it's important to try and have adequate levels of phosphorus when, you're, when you have a new seeding because uh, those seedlings will really take advantage of, of phosphorus, especially if phosphorus levels are low. It helps them build, build roots. Uh, of course, perennial plants, uh, root development is normally very slow. It takes a lot longer than annual plants do. And so they need the phosphorus is a, is a big help in that area. One of, the, uh, one of the things that we have with a problem with phosphorus is with the high pH soils that we have that are very highly buffered with calcium and magnesium, those soils can uh, make phosphorus unavailable. The plant available component of phosphorus can be tied up and may, and it's no longer available to plants. So that's an issue. Um, so when you're applying phosphorus, you have to keep in mind that uh, you want to apply what the plants are going to be able to use in a short period of time, like uh, maybe a year, perhaps two years at the most, because the longer that plant available phosphorus is exposed to these high pH, high calcium and magnesium soils, the more phosphorus it ties up and they're no longer available to plants. You don't want to be spending a lot of money at 74 cents a pound for plant available phosphorus if it's just going to get tied up and be available for only a very short period of time. So it's important to, to uh, get those phosphorus applications right. Okay, let's look at the next slide. Here we look at potassium, and I'm just alternating between these two different labs uh, because the, the um, nutrients are very similar in the uh, in the an analyst uh, the the analyzation of the lab. They're very similar, so you'll see the potassium um, in this slide is and the zero to six inch depth is uh, 191 parts per million, which is the same as 380 pounds per acre. So this soil has lots of uh, potassium and potassium levels vary widely uh, field to field. And um, uh, remember uh, potassium is a fairly inexpensive nutrient at uh, 50, cents a pound roughly compared to 75 cents a pound for nitrogen and phosphorus. So it's a, it's a cheaper nutrient, but you wanna make sure if the levels are low or even marginal that you get some potassium on there because they can certainly be important for plant growth. Um, but in this soil, potassium levels are optimum. So the next slide. And in the next slide, we are gonna look at sulfur levels. Sulfur levels are really important. And in this soil, they're listed as uh, marginal or close to deficient. Uh, when sulfur is low, other plant nutrients are less, uh, uh, are, are less usable by the plant. Um, and the other plant nutrients aren't effectively utilized when, when sulfur levels are low. 
and those sulfur low sulfur levels have to be rectified in order to take advantage of the other nutrients that you've added or that are available in the soil. Um, plants can only use sulfur in the sulfate form, uh, elemental sulfur, if it's applied as an as elemental sulfur, which is just straight S. Uh, it has to be broken down to uh, to sulfate sulfur, which is the only form that can be used by plants. That's what they have to take up. So um, if you're using elemental sulfur, you have to make sure that um, uh, it's been a field that has been fertilized with sulfate sulfur uh, periodically at some time in the past, because it can take up to a extra year for the sulfate sulfur to become available. So you need to have a bit of a buildup of sulfate sulfur in those soils if you're gonna to switch to elemental sulfur. So it's okay to use elemental sulfur. It will become available over time, but uh, you're gonna also need a response to sulfur in the current year. So you'll need some sulfate sulfur as well, and then gradually switch over to elemental sulfur, which is, uh, which is cheaper. The graph that we looked at before had elemental sulfur at about 24 cents a pound, whereas sulfate sulfur is 42 cents a pound. So and sulfur is very, very important, especially with uh, alfalfa. It's, it's important with all, with, with both the grasses and the legumes, but uh, uh, legumes are heavy users of sulfur. Um, let's uh, go to the next slide. So we just want to talk about uh, boron um, in this slide. Um, the A and L analysis uh, was medium, uh, and one sample was very low for boron. Uh, the the uh, the Exova lab didn't analyze for boron, and that uh, brings me to make sure to mention that uh, you should be sure that you fill out the the uh, soil sample report uh, carefully before you send it off to the lab because they need to know um, they need to know things like um, um, what kind of crop you're going to be growing with that fertilizer recommendation and um, they're going to need to know if you want an analysis for boron and I'd recommend that you get an analysis, an analysis for boron if your soils are adequate in boron you don't need to request a boron test in future applications and maybe not for a number of years but um, you should at, at least initially get a test for boron because if you're low in boron it can certainly impact yields especially on alfalfa. Uh, let's look at uh, Oh, the other thing, uh, boron, when you are low in boron, you can apply sufficient levels for three years, but uh, boron is also a toxic nutrient. And if it's uh, applied in, in uh, it's very easy to over apply it. So if it's applied at levels of over four pounds per acre, it can be toxic to plant growth. Okay, next slide. Oh, just can you back up and I just want to say one thing more about this slide here. You see the plant, uh, the alfalfa leaves on the right, you see that white speckling on those leaves. Those are very characteristics of, of boron deficiencies, um, or sorry, potassium deficiencies. The plant on the left is boron. Um, the cup leaves are, are uh, significant and boron deficiencies, but the, the spots on the plant at the plant leaves at the right are very typical of potassium deficiency symptoms. Now there's a problem with that too, because uh, you can get potassium deficient plants because of cold soils or root injury. So uh, plants that have had uh, root injury due to being stepped on or being uh, uh, traffic on them, or perhaps things like uh, um, frost damage to the plants, they can, they can exhibit uh, uh, potassium deficiency symptoms, even though the soil levels may be adequate or high in potassium. So you have to be careful when you're looking at the plants to determine 
whether your soils are low in those nutrients, particularly with potassium. Okay, the next slide. Okay. There's often a debate as to whether you want to apply fertilizer during the seeding year or not. And this is particularly uh, of concern when you're looking at dry land um, seedings. Now, dry land seedings, especially with annuals, um, the root development and the development of that seedling is very, very slow, and they don't use up very many nutrients when the plant is so small and the root system is so small. So if you apply nitrogen and it's not essential, that nitrogen can get used up by competing vegetation and actually damage your seeding because uh, the nitrogen or other nutrients that you might apply could result in uh, a reduction in the establishment of your crop. Um, on the other hand, if you are if you prepare the seed bed uh, well and get rid of the competing vegetation, uh, the nitrogen and the phosphorus can be extremely helpful in getting establishing a very vigorous and healthy seedling. And I really learned a lesson on this um, issue on a on a on a seeding actually just north of Gary Karchuk. Uh, on, on the Skookumchuck Prairie. And uh, we had uh, established a seedling, a seeding on that dryland uh, pasture in 1983. And we, uh, it was kind of an interesting situation. We, we didn't uh, have the nitrogen that we wanted to apply during the seeding. It was a fall seeding in November. Uh, we only had enough to apply it on half the field. And it was amazing how the, uh, the nitrogen and phosphorus uh, uh, resulted in, in an extreme difference in the uh, vigor and health of those seedlings. The, uh, without the, the area that didn't have the nitrogen and phosphorus, the plants were half the size of the next summer, the next early spring, compared to the areas that were fertilized. So. Um, if you are able to kill competing vegetation, make sure you get the fertility on those plants in the seedling stage. Um, so on, on, the, on Jerry's fields, uh, we looked at recommendations uh, based on those soil test results. And um, uh, we looked at uh, applying uh, uh, nitrogen and phosphorus uh, and sulfur on those fields, uh, uh, on those dryland sites. And the next slide, we'll talk a little in more depth about the recommendations that we have for those, that site. So can we do the next slide? There we come, okay. So we looked at apply in the current year, we looked at applying uh, uh, 20 pounds of N, 20 pounds of P2O5, 10 pounds of sulfur, and a pound of boron. And we, if, if there was a desire not to apply fertilize, fertilizer in the, uh, the um, what we recommended was that uh, the increase the level of nitrogen to 60 pounds and increase the level of phosphate to 30 pounds in order to be able to avoid uh, fertilizing again in year two and possibly in year three. Uh, these types of and um, <clears throat> In dry land, the nitrogen will still be available in year two and three if the plants don't utilize it because there's not enough precipitation to push that uh, those nutrients out of the rooting zone. So you can apply fertilizer uh, once over a two to three year period by just increasing the amount of fertilizer and uh, 
the, with the expectation that you'll have sufficient nutrients in the second or possibly the third year. So I think that that's, let's look at the other slide and we'll quickly see what's left here. Some knowledge gaps and general recommendations. Let's look at the next slide. Um, so some of the things that we really are deficient in, in terms of knowledge issues in this valley are, is calibrating the soil test results with the response from applied fertilizers. Uh, we don't have these calibration tests in the valley. Uh, there was one done in the um, late 1980s uh, in, in this valley, uh, and I can't find the information from that test. But um, generally speaking, we are short of uh, tests that demonstrate plant response to fertilizer nutrient application. And um, as a result, we're kind of flying blind. Uh, we use judgment and uh, look at what happens uh, through experience with fertilizer application and yield response, but it's tough. So the next uh, knowledge gap or information gap that we have is uh, uh, how to measure soil health and track changes over time. And there's more and more information becoming available about soil health and how to manage and maintain soil health over time. And we need to get with it and start to do measurements specifically for soil health and monitor our soil health over time. Uh, we certainly don't want to be depleting plant nutrients and have to use even higher rates when fertilizer prices are even higher in the future. We want to be able to maintain those rates, those uh, nutrients um, earlier rather than later and enjoy the benefits of a healthier soil with higher organic matter levels and uh, more active uh, micronutrients, which are critical elements in soil health. And then another question is, it would be great to determine how quickly applied phosphate becomes tied up and unavailable to plants. As we mentioned before, high pH soils with high calcium and magnesium in them, they can really tie up phosphorus. And so we, but there's no information on how quickly that happens in this area. Um, can, if, for instance, can we apply a higher rate of phosphorus during the seeding year at a time when it's possible to incorporate that phosphorus into the seed bed uh, and then have enough phosphorus in that seed bed for the next maybe three or four years. Phosphorus is a very immobile nutrient and when it's broadcast on the surface, not much of it goes below the surface. Most of the phosphorus will be still within the top half to three quarters of an inch on the, uh, of the surface of that ground. And so the only way that they can be taken up is by plant roots coming up to the surface, which they do. And they do absorb uh, phosphorus from the surface or just barely below the surface of the plant or of the soil. But um, uh, information on, on uh, how long that soil can hang around without being utilized by plants and still be available to plants in the future due to being tied up with the soils with the soil chemistry. So one more slide, please. Uh, yeah, so again, there's very little work available on comparing yield responses to fertilizer applications. Uh, the question of how much fertilizer to apply, when and how often, is one of the most important farm decisions you can make in terms of increasing revenue and reducing costs. Um, uh, one way to address this is to test soil a, a little bit more frequently than normally occurs. It's generally advised to test soil every two to three years. And it's really important to um, keep track of those results because they're important even 10 or 15 years later when you want to see what kinds of changes have happened with your soils. 
some of the kinds of things that we can do, and we don't do it often enough, is make sure that we put in test strips. Uh, probably you could do this almost every year as a, add on an additional layer of phosphorus and maybe add on an additional layer of nitrogen to see if you get plant responses from them. Okay, the next slide. So the next steps of the Karchak Ranch, and Jerry, I think we should keep our fingers crossed for more moisture than we've got so far this year. And uh, maybe if uh, I see some clouds floating around here, I'll try and blow them over across the river your way. Um, we should try to make some observa observations on what's happened with uh, fertilizer uh, on your area and maybe look at some test strips to, to just uh, z visually see or do some clip, quick clippings to see what kind of response you're getting from those soil applications. And uh, there's a great photo of Jerry. It looks like he's getting a horse used to some roping and that's a pretty fancy loop. <laughs> Next slide, please. Got very stiff cows. <laughs> <laughs> very sick cow, indeed. No, very okay. stiff. <laughs> uh, Hillary, do you want to take over and do these uh, these announcement slides? Sure. We do have a follow up day, so it's May eighteenth from twelve to four thirty. We are crossing our fingers we can do this event in person. If COVID restrictions continue to haunt us, we will be switching this to an online platform, but we have Mike Malenberg and Norm Ward joining us out at Jerry's. Um, Mike will be going over the soils again, and then Norm will be going over um, a bunch of different tools he has in his tool house he's helped Jerry with. Um, Norm is a regenerative agriculture specialist out of uh, primarily Alberta. He spent a number of years in Southern Alberta uh, he had a big ranch in the Porcupine Hills, and he now ranches with his son up in uh, Northwest BC. And uh, you might have recognized the Power Grazer, that's Norm's company, so he'll be bringing out some of those tools as well. I believe Jordy's got one kicking around his place from a project this spring as well, so some of you might have seen that in action. Um, so that'll be a great day out there, uh, lots of really cool stuff, and I think Norm's planning to talk quite a bit about what is it, something, the soil microbiome. So that'll be new discussion for a number of us. Um, and then just another soil resource for the region. This is the Pacific Regional Society of Soil Science. So if anyone's interested in some more resources or information, there are uh, events happening locally and I do believe they're trying to start a soils club. So just another plug for that. And then I think I'll pass it back over to Rachel to run through questions and discussion if there are any. Okay, thank you, Hillary. Um, Mike, thank you so much. That was um, a fantastic presentation. And I know we asked you to jam a lot of information into a lunchtime event. So you did an excellent job. Thank you so much. I know you put a ton of hours into this. Um, and I'm sure that it generated a lot of uh, questions. So if anybody has a question, they can unmute now and, and ask Mike. You can also put it in the chat box. If you have to run, we totally understand this event is recorded. So we'll be sending it out to participants. Um, if you wanna stick around for discussion, absolutely do that. And um, yeah, the mics are open. Terrific job with the uh, slides, Hillary. Oh, it was all Mike, really. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna click on this uh, chat and see what we have. Uh, okay. I, I have a question for you, Mike. Yes. Um, you know, it seems like one of the inherent qualities of the East Kootenai soil seems to be, you know, a, a coarser textured soil with low nutrient holding capacity in general. Um, what, what do you suggest to sort of help build any nutrient holding capacity or and, and therefore moisture holding capacity as well, potentially? 
Well, it's it it's it's all rests on soil organic matter level because uh, you can't un unless it's a garden spot or something where you might be able to uh, bring in nutrients uh, and or organic matter through uh, through you know top dressing your soils in, in a garden area. Other than that, your your um, the, your options are to do whatever you can to increase organic matter levels. And um, organic matter levels come with higher production levels. Uh, they, uh, soils in these Kootenays have, I believe, improved markedly over the last 50 years. And a lot of that is because people are using more fertilizer. They're getting higher yields. Um, most of the uh, farms in these Kootenays have cattle. And so those cattle graze those uh, those uh, annual perennial forage crops. And uh, so they're putting back some of the harvested nutrients back on the land through manure and urine. And, um, and also just the uh, increased production uh, provides a lot more plant material on the surface. Many people feed their cattle uh, on fields that are going to be re-established in the near future. And so they get an extra helping of, of organic matter on those fields during the winter feeding period. So there are a number of things that can be done, but, um, and they're extremely important. Uh, they have had impacts, I'm sure, over the last number of years. So uh, uh, making sure that uh, the soil is covered, making sure there's um, a winter cover whenever possible so that you don't get runoff erosion uh, and just keep the organic matter level coming and being utilized to the greatest extent possible is uh, it's and it's really really helpful don't uh, uh, don't be discouraged it uh, your soils will change as uh, yields go up and they will especially change very rapidly as uh, some of that organic matter stays on those fields. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Mike. And I guess a good way to test that is just, or, or to gauge that is just by having that reading in the soil test of your percent organic matter yeah. as a gauge. Yeah. yeah, and you'll certainly notice it over, over a period of a decade or, or uh, you know, 10 or 15 years, you'll notice it because you'll see the color changing, it'll darken. And you'll also notice the tilt of the soil just by handling the soil, holding it in your hands, you'll be able to feel that there's, uh, uh, there's more um, bulk to the soil. Uh, there's, uh, there, it, it's, it's easier to handle and manage. You'll be able to see, uh, probably see the uh, plant material in the soil just from uh, better roots and, uh, and the, uh, the, the, the increasing level of organic material. So you can see it as well. Great, thank you, Mike. We just need 10 or 15 years to-, to Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> uh, you, can, you can feel it, you can smell it, you can taste it, and, and it, it, it'll, it'll all be better. Time will heal. <laughs> and keep the level of production up. Uh, uh, using water, uh, most of our crop production is under irrigation, and irrigation jumps production up tremendously. You know, there's probably at least a, a four to five fold increase in 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 crop production under irrigation. So, uh, and uh, half is much production goes on underground as goes on above ground. So it all adds uh, organic matter to soils. Okay, thank you, Mike. Great answer. Does anybody else want to ask a question? Hi, Mike, it's Leanne. Um, just a question about the nitrogen that you were talking about earlier and putting on and off for two years. Are you talking about using slow release N for that? Because I know one thing we've always been concerned about is how volatile it is and just losing it to the atmosphere. 
Yeah, uh, Leanne, good question. That's a really good question. And I, I think slow re, or slowly, re, uh, sorry, slow release nitrogen. And there's a couple of different kinds. There's a polymer and then there's a, a coating uh, that will both result in slow release. I would say slow, re, slow release is more important though. The most important application for slow release is, um, is when you're fertilizing for the current year. Um, if, if you're looking at the need, uh, preserving that nitrogen for the second year, the big issue there is to make sure that you're not leaching it out of the root zone. That's where it'll be lost is leaching from the root zone. And um, so make sure that uh, you're, uh, make sure that you're, water situation, if it's irrigation is okay. If it's not irrigation, uh, if, it's, if, it's, uh, if it doesn't run off at the time that it's applied or doesn't volatilize in the, at the time that it's applied, that it, it'll still be there for the second year. So and I guess what I'm trying to say is that uh, slow release is not gonna help so much in terms of making sure it's available there for the second year the slow release benefit is making sure that it's available for the first year, that it actually gets into the soil, it avoids volatilization, and that once it's in the soil, um, the way you want to control loss once it's incorporated into the soil through moisture is that, uh, that you don't over apply moisture and leach it out of the root zone. Does so that if help you were, you? Yeah, definitely. But if, if you were dry land, um, isn't it, and it, if you had a bad precipitation year, um, is, is it not a bit risky to try and put two on, two years worth on in a dry land situation? Well, in terms of losing uh, it? Again, again, not really, because it's uh, the, the problem, whether you put one year's uh, amount on or two years amount on, the time that you're gonna lose it is through volatilization when it's laying on the surface. Mm -hmm. Once it goes into the soil, then your big worry is whether you're gonna lose it because it's gonna get leached out of the root zone. If it's dry land, it's not gonna get leached out of the root, root zone. So the, the, the slow release issue is, is around the time that it's at, applied, not, it's not an issue for the second year. Uh, am I being, am I being, do you under, am I being clear about that? <laughs> yeah, I'm just wondering whether you're using slow or regular, if in a dry land situation, if it's, it is a bit risky, like if you had a really dry year, you didn't get much precip, it would be staying too close to the surface, wouldn't it, or? No, and the other problem is slow release, slow release is uh, short lived, the, the slow release factor is, uh, is gone in about two to three weeks. Uh, the, pollen, the polymerized soil release is a bit longer than that. But if it's laying there on top of the ground and there's no precipitation, um, even if it's slow release, it's, it's, not, it's gonna disappear uh, if, after two to three weeks time. So it's not an issue about whether it's for one year or for two years. It's an issue as to whether you get it into the ground in the first place at the time that it's applied. I, does that help, Leanne? Yes, thanks, Mike. I'm, I'm st still just thinking that even if you use regular and never mind the slow release part is that dry land does seem a, a little bit risky to me in, um, it, in terms it is, of losing in terms of the volatization that's all yeah it, that's right and that and that's an issue at the that's an issue uh if you don't get enough moisture in the first um few weeks or 30 days at the most then you're going to lose a lot of nitrogen at that point in time yeah, but once it does go into the ground through through moisture at some point in time, uh, in dry land, it'll be there for the next year's crop. There's not enough moisture to take it out. 
Okay, thanks. So would you suggest, Mike, that if you are applying nitrogen fertilizer to dry land, timing is everything with the forecast? The timing is everything and have a look at, the, at those slow release uh, or protected uh, nitrogen because, uh, boy, if you can get it on and there's a rain, then you don't have to go through the expense of slow release. But if you don't get that rain, you lose, you lose big. So it's a gamble. And even, some people even use uh, a mixture of slow release and um, uh, non-protected nitrogen. Uh, it just kind of reduces the risk. And the other thing that happens is if you, um, if you, uh, if you do get it into the, in, in the case of irrigation, if you do get it into the soil zone, you're not gonna push it out with, with uh, heavy applications of water. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I just had a, a quick question about uh, soil sampling. Um, where what would be a local resource to uh, to get that done or get started? Um, I know you mentioned twenty to twenty five uh, sub samples on a main sample. Um, mm -hmm. What kind of volume are we talking about for a sample? Oh, okay. Well, you uh, the the amount of soil that you need in a sample is about uh, uh, a cup and a half, a cup, a cup and a half. So the total amount that you send to the soil lab is maybe a little over a cup of soil. Um, but the total, once you've taken uh, 20 to 25 samples, you'll probably have about, uh, I don't know, eight cups or 10 cups of soil, maybe more in that bucket. So you'll, you'll mix it up and break down the clods, take out any um, uh, chunks of root material or rocks, et cetera, dry it, and then take a, a, a sample of that, uh, of that uh, mixture of soils to send to the lab. And the amount that you take would be about, yeah, a cup or a cup and a half out of that, maybe what might be 10 cups of soil that you've collected with, with uh, 20 or 30 sub samples. Okay. Um... You, can, you can contact, um, uh, there's a fertilizer company, a blending plant in the valley, uh, Interior Seed and Feed in Cranbrook, and they, um, they can help get you set up with uh, uh, where to send the sample to, or you can, um, you can contact Element. Uh, it's sometimes still listed in phone books under Exova. You can contact them or A, uh, A and P and uh, 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 contact their labs and they will send you material. They'll send you boxes and information about how to take the sample and how to fill out the uh, information form that it goes, goes with you as well. So there's, there's, yeah, there's resources available. Uh, give me a shout or give me a call and I'd be glad to spend some more time talking to you about it. Perfect. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that. Good, Brandon. Thanks. And Brandon, yeah, I just put my email in the chat box there and you can shoot me an email because we do have like um, kind of a package that we can email you that provides like, you know, kind of specific guidelines about how to collect those soil samples. Okay, yeah, perfect. I'm seeing that there, I'll, uh, I'll write that down. Okay, great. Uh, it's us, Jordy here. I'm uh, just wondering if, Mike, you would recommend sending those same soil samples to both labs, or does that just confuse things? Uh, Jordy, I think it just confuses things. I think both of those labs will do an adequate job. Uh, I'm concerned about labs that don't use the Kelowna extract. Now, there is a uh, labs can uh, use uh, regression equations to calculate what it would be if it was a Kelowna extract. Normally, they don't do it. Um, I would, uh, I would just send it to one or the other, and I think you could send it to either. The thing that you want to do though, is phone the lab and discuss with them how they make those recommendations. The best thing to do is to find a local person that's familiar with, um, 
with looking at soil lab results and making recommendations from them and work with them. Um, I guess that's one of the most important things to do if you are, you want to cultivate a re good relationship with a soil advisor, somebody that you can talk to and discuss these issues. Uh, you'll want to, you'll want to put in test strips and, and observe the uh, response from those test strips and you'll need to have someone to talk to uh, as you examine those. So if you have a if you have a, an advisor, a fertilizer company, or somebody from a lab, um, and labs are always, uh, I've found, are always more than happy to talk to you to discuss any questions or concerns that you have, or give me a call. <laughs> Perfect, thanks. Does anybody else have a question or, or can we let Mike go and tend his garden? <laughs> All right, well, if nobody else has a question right now, you know where to find us. And Mike is one of KBFA's general advisors. We, we don't like to keep him too busy. We like to bring him out on special occasions, but we can reach out for soil advice especially. So if you do have soil samples you want Mike to review, we'd be happy to connect you to. And um, I'd just like to say, it's really nice to see everybody's face. It's been kind of a long winter without much uh, human contact. So this Brady Bunch screen, uh, you know, filled my cup this morning. So thanks everybody. And uh, we look forward to hopefully seeing you in person at the Parchuck Ranch in the spring and, and many other events to come. So thanks so much for your, your participation. Thank you. Great, it's, uh, wonderful to see you all. Bye-bye. <laughs>